Hello everybody in uh, Facebook again. Uh, I'm getting a lot of good responses on these um, live teachings that I'm doing. Uh, several people get on while I'm live and um, what's amazing to me is the last two teachings I've done have had over a thousand people view. Uh, so I seem to be hitting some things of interest for people. Um, today I want to talk about the um, sons and daughters, spiritual sons and daughters and talk about uh, the orphan spirit that so many people are fighting in this day. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of young people in this next generation um, that are going through a lot of different things. And I thought like, well, probably today I need to address this. It goes, ties right in really with a chapter in my latest book on apostolic life and talking about spiritual fathers. But also I have another book out and it's called Kingdom Discipleship. And I have an entire chapter on the orphan spirit in this book. I also talk about spiritual fathering and, and some of those different things. So I thought I would probably cover some of these aspects. Uh, this is a huge topic, so I'm trying to hold these to about 15 minutes. And, uh, you know, that seems to be about the right length of time. So I'm going to get right into it. The main verse that everyone uses for uh, spiritual sonship is out, out of Malachi, of course, where he says, He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And we always use that of, uh, you know, who's turning whose heart where. When we start looking at some of the words in the original Hebrew, the word curse means to utterly destroy it means to forfeit or to dedicate for destruction, to mutilate, to perforate. And the big one that pops out to me in the description is to disqualify for service. Now, the earth isn't getting disqualified for service. But what it's actually talking about is sons and daughters both being disqualified. If a father's heart is not turned towards their spiritual kids, they will be disqualified for the service of being a spiritual father. Likewise, if the hearts of the son or daughter is not turned to the spiritual father, they will be disqualified for service as well. See, it's not talking about the earth having a curse, but the earth is going to actually feel the curse of sons and daughters not being in relationship. So it's two directional. There are all the sons and daughters relationships with fathers are voluntary. Uh, they're voluntary in the fashion that... Um, they are divinely appointed. They are divinely connected. Uh, the secondary verse is found in Romans 8.15, the spirit of adoption. And it says in Romans 8.15, For you have not received the spirit of, a, of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. The spirit of bondage is the state of a person. The description in the Greek is the state of a person who cannot enjoy his inheritance. So he says, you've not, you're not in bondage anymore. You're not in a state of not enjoying your inheritance, but you've been placed into a state that you could enjoy your inheritance. So he says, the act of that is the spirit of adoption. The word adoption in the Greek means to be seated as a son. And so basically God seats us as a son or seats us as a daughter and looks at us as adopted in or adopted into his family. The word adoption, if you start to study this out, actually is not like our modern day opinion of what adoption is. In that day, adoption meant it is as if you were born in the family and did not have any other kind of parent. Uh, there were no orphans in that day. All the orphans, if the father and mother both died, someone would take that person in and they would adopt them. And in the culture, it was as if they were born in that family from the very first day. They did not look at the past of like they have a, a father and a mother over here and, and like a secondary son or daughter. They were actually looked at as primary, having the same kinds of um, privilege and right and all of those things. So the spirit of adoption and the spirit of bondage are both formed by our faith creating a state of mind of what we want to believe. In other words, they are created by our perceptions. Our perceptions of who we are and how God values us 
is very important because it forms how we're going to interact with God and interact with spiritual fathers and mothers. Now today what I see happening in the church is God has been really uh, working with leaders in their identity because I believe there's a lot of leaders that have an identity that's coming out of an orphan type spirit. An orphan spirit will only produce other orphans. Every spiritual father has to have at first be a son, and then they can know what fathering really is. Uh, if a person is only producing orphans in their ministry, then there's something wrong with that leader producing, um, producing those orphans. There's an orphan spirit because it's the law of reproduction. So spiritual fathering, uh, a father has to have their identity settled. A father is looking that their sons and daughters would excel beyond what they were able to do and would also be able to accomplish and leave a secondary inheritance. It's what's called a father's blessing. Father's blessing was when a father said, not only am I blessing you with the inheritance that you have, I'm also blessing you with this, the ability to go out and create a second inheritance. It's like a double blessing or a double inheritance that they wanted their sons and daughters to to have. So the the act of spiritual fathering is all voluntary. It's divine connections. It's relationship driven. Uh, there are a lot of different things that we can say about it, uh, but basically it ends up that we become a covenantal son with God, and God looks at us as a son or a daughter that have the same rights as His Son Jesus. Most people today are not really looking for spiritual fathers. There's two groups. There's ones that are looking. And then there's another group that's actually looking for grandfathers. They're wanting grandfathers to affirm and bless them, which basically means to spoil them. But in, inheritances aren't necessarily passed from grandparents to, to grandchildren. They're passed to, the, to their sons, and then those sons and daughters transfer them down to their, their sons and daughters. So grandparents normally create inheritance, but inheritance is passed down from sons and daughters. So looking at this thing of Romans 8 and going a little further in Romans 8, 19, says the earnest expectation of the creature, creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The word manifest, we could say, well, it's a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit's activity in a person's life. But the word manifestation means the appearing of, the discourse of truth and instruction, events by which things or states or persons have withdrawn from view and are made visible. In other words, they are bringing something into, into a view that's never been seen before. And that basically, when you start looking at it, this whole section is dealing about the position of sons and daughters, those that are led by the Spirit are the sons and daughters of God. The truth, the disclosure of truth and instruction is to come from the sons and, God, uh, sons and daughters of God. And the truth that they're conveying is adoption. Adoption is based on three things. It's based on the revelation that you have of your adoption. The revelation of adoption always will allow you to have privilege, privilege with God and privilege with your spiritual father. All of my sons and daughters my spiritual sons and daughters have that privilege. They have a privilege that they are not a nuisance. They are not a burden. They are to call me when they are struggling. They, they a lot of times will text me first to just to know, hey, can we talk? So there's a revelation that equals privilege. The second thing that comes is the relationship out of the revelation. Relationship means that I have a place, that God has put me into a place, set me in a place, and I have a right to be in that place. And then the third thing that comes out of that is we start to understand the Bible in a very different way. We're actually reading our legal document of who we are as sons and daughters. So it becomes covenantal. And so God is trying to get us in this, in this hour to take an emerging generation that basically is fatherless to a large degree and looking for fathers that have been seasoned and have their own issues dealt with, that they're able to help those sons and daughters be able to excel at a higher rate. Now, when we start looking at the aspect of spiritual sons and daughters, the first thing we normally come to is this thing of an orphan spirit. 
when we have an orphan spirit, we're seeing God as more or less a taskmaster and that he's very hard to please. And so we start to posture ourselves into a performance-driven mentality. We believe that there is punishment that's due me. We have a fear of relationships. We, we try to gain acceptance by performance, by positioning, by competition. All of those kinds of things are an orphan spirit or have an orphan mentality. But the spirit of sonship has a mentality that says God is a loving father. And he wants to be close to me and have intimacy with me. God, God's love is not based on my performance or my personal giftings or my, uh, my, uh, my good behavior or however you want to put it. God loves me unconditionally. And God loves you whether there, today, whether you act out, where you fail, where you succeed. He loves you the same all the way through it. And so he wants to have a relationship with you and intimacy with you in your emotions, in your spiritual life, and all of those things. And so he's changing the mentality of us that we are not valued that to being accepted, that we have, have substance, that we have worth and self-worth, that our opinion matters, and that we're not having to be fearful that our opinion counts or that we are distanced from God because we're thinking something that may be amiss. So spiritual fathers come along and how they work with sons and daughters is the first thing is, is they try to break off that orphan spirit. They break off the fact that they don't belong, that their feelings don't count, that no one loves them, and that they, they are best to isolate away so they're not hurt again. And so they, a spiritual father starts to do that by loving and nurturing and building up that person. The way it happens is a, a, a spiritual father cannot help a spiritual son and daughter unless they first have a vision from God for them. They have to ask God, who is this person to you? What gifts and callings do they have within them? And there's a divine connection with the, with the intentions of God for that person to help that person become what that spiritual father sees in their life. The, the way it comes is the, the sons and daughters, it takes a while to build trust. And sons and daughters have to be transparent in their heart and relationships take time to develop. As the relationships develop, the son and daughter is going to have to expose their heart to that spiritual father to be able to have areas of their life touched. I have several that have totally exposed their hearts to me, but it took over some time for them to trust me. The same way, though, a spiritual father is exposing their heart. A spiritual father lives in transparency before their sons and daughters so they can see how they handle the way that they conduct life, their manner of life, like Paul said. They, they do it so that the a son and daughter can see uh, that it's just not all living on the mountaintop, but every spiritual father and every leader struggles just like a lot of other people with different areas of their life. It's how do you handle those struggles? I'm very transparent with my sons and daughters. I allow them to see my life as it is, and that helps them see that it's not a hierarchy, that I'm not living over here saying one thing and doing the opposite. They see, they see me work through the process and thus know that I'm there to help them work through the process. So you're not expecting your sons and daughters to make, uh, to be a 100% um, fail, fail proof, 100% on target. You expect them to make mistakes, but you never abandon them when a mistake is made. You walk out life with them and through that mistake, and both you and them both learn. It's releasing the potential and believing in them and not demanding from them that they just have blind faith or blind obedience to you, being able to explain that to them so that they understand uh, this, is what, this is what's expected in God more so than what's expected in me. A father will have expectation of their children. They want more or less a return on their investment, but they're never disappointed in their kids. And even if their kids fail, they're still there for them. So the way we have it today in culture and society, a lot of, a lot of uh, fathers have abandoned their, their kids, abused their kids, 
uh, disown their kids even, or even kids have had to disown their own uh, spiritual fathers or mothers because they were detrimental in their life. The one thing I will say is sometimes our natural father is affecting how we're seeing our spiritual father, and our spiritual father has been sent by God to show us what Father God looks like. So to me, probably one of the greatest responsibilities is not so much in the apostolic or fivefold ministry calling, it's when you begin to really father people because that's the place of real reproduction. Paul, Paul fathered Timothy and he saw something in Timothy and was watching him from afar. He saw the good reports in Timothy's life. He wanted to invest into Timothy's life and when we start reading the the life of Paul and Timothy and that's a book I'm getting ready to write that's my next book is the life of Paul and Timothy we see that they traveled thousands of miles together they did ministry together Paul saw said that he had no one like Timothy who had his heart like Timothy or had his passion like Timothy but he also showed Timothy his manner of life he showed him how he felt in the struggles of life and Timothy got, was able to be able to see uh, exactly how Paul handled every situation. The book Philemon is probably the greatest book on spiritual sonship and very seldom read, but it's also another book where Paul takes and wins Onesimus while he's in jail, and the Onesimus was looked at as one that was worthless, and Paul said, this man has become of value to me. And he did it because Onesimus was pursu pursuing fall, Paul as a spiritual father and would relentlessly pursue until he would give way. And so partly what has to happen is spiritual sons and daughters pursue fathers. And fathers sometimes will pursue sons and daughters, but they're not going to pursue very hard. They want to see if that son and daughter really want that relationship. And the relationship has to be more than just the titling saying, I have a few sons and daughters, and I have this list. It actually has to be a what I call a functional, accountable relationship, meaning that there is contact being made, there's conversations going on, and there's a life-giving flow that's coming from the spiritual father into the sons and daughters, and the sons and daughters are able to have an advantage in life because of that. And, the, and they're drawing off of the life experience of that spiritual father. A spiritual father has got to go through life struggles to have the experiences to be able to converse and talk to their sons and daughters. So today that was a pretty quick little overview of the life of spiritual sonship. Uh, see the thing of it is God is bringing fatherhood back into the church because we have sons and daughters coming into sonship, but we haven't quite yet seen sons and daughters fully developed yet. It's because we haven't seen fathers fully developed yet. The role and responsibility of fathers is very far reaching in this hour, and we've got to step up our game. If you're a spiritual father out there or mother, you're, you're stepping up your game because there's a demand being put upon your life by sons and daughters. You go looking for answers to try to help them through life's difficulties. So if you're wanting some more information on spiritual fathering, uh, John, John Alley has a great book on called The Spirit of Sonship. I've put some things in here today on, on apostolic life, a living grace. I've put some things scattered through here on spiritual fathering because all apostles are fathers. If you're looking for other information, there's an entire chapter in Kingdom Discipling that I wrote just on the orphan spirit, another chapter on spiritual fathering. And I may cover this topic a little more because I feel like it's very needed, but it's one of those things that we've, we've got to keep explaining and bringing some understanding so that people don't get caught in relationships that are not productive or non-functional. I believe there's a lot of people today that are looking for fathers. I have a prophetic word even over my life that God would send me sons and daughters and the next training and school and section of life that I would be doing would be entirely about fathering. And I'm seeing that beginning to occur that I'm doing so much more fathering, almost more than any kind of teaching or instructing. So God bless you. Hopefully this helps to answer a few questions today. And we'll see you again and we'll talk about something else the next time. God bless and have a great day.